You know, to be completely honest with you guys, a red flag as massive as your mercenary band leader saying he bought a weird looking talisman because it was said to give its owner the world in exchange for his flesh and blood is not something to be simply ignored. But in Guts' defense, he didn't know if Griffith was joking or being serious at the time, and nothing could have prepared him for what lay ahead, except maybe a visit from the Skull Knight. The Crimson Behelet first appeared in the final prelude chapter of Berserk before the series was formally volumized, and it is only made Made a handful of appearances since, but it has quickly become one of the most important and terrifying artifacts in all of anime and manga history. This seemingly innocuous egg-shaped rock does nothing by itself. The only way to harm someone with it is maybe by chucking it really hard at their heads. But when the prime conditions for its activation are met, it turns into a literal harbinger of death and destruction. Even amongst its own kind, and yes, there is a kind of behelet, it's revered as the egg of the king, and the appearance appearance of a crimson behelet can only mean one thing. But what exactly is that thing? Why is this goofy looking rock one of the most feared astral artifacts in Berserk? And what exactly is its connection to the past, present, and future of the story? We'll answer all that and more in this video. This is the Crimson Behelet's origins explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means an awful lot. Thank you, let's begin. It debuts as a part of playtime with Griffith and Guts, but we already know the implications. The Crimson Behelet's introduction. If you were to look at the chapter that this dread object was introduced in in isolation, you'd have been just as confused as Guts was when he first saw it. The Crimson Behelet debuts in the final prelude chapter of Berserk, titled The Golden Age Part 8. After holding the rear guard against a vicious pursuit mostly by himself, Guts celebrates with his new comrades, but instead of passing out by the time the sun rises, he looks out over the castle walls as if already searching for his next destination. Judo shows up to break his melancholy, which is when Guts asks him just why they all follow Griffith. What kind of a man was he? And Judo's answer leaves much to be desired, but it is also a proper answer for the lack of a better term. He explains that their great leader can seem mature beyond his years at times, and more like a child than he should be at others. But what draws everyone towards him is his unparalleled charisma. Griffith's unwavering confidence in his own abilities and his lofty goals draw people towards him as if they were moths, and he was the brightest light in the world. Of course, for Guts, it was different. Griffith had to beat Guts to acquire him, and so he didn't really get what Judo meant until he met Griffith a few moments later and found the guy buck nude pouring water on top of himself to try to shake off the hangover from last night's celebrations. Griffith asks Guts to join him. Guts refuses, so Griffith splashes him with a face full of water. Guts, not to be outdone, returns the favor, and the pair go at it until they're both exhausted and sit down for a breather. Guts has the last laugh as he dumps the final pail of water on Griffith's head, who sportingly concedes while acknowledging Guts' stubbornness. This is when Guts notices the strange necklace dangling from Griffith's neck, a crimson red egg-like stone with the misshapen features of a face engraved on it. Griffith looks at it as if he'd almost forgotten about it, and then drops that line we spoke of in the intro earlier as if it were just another truth of the world. Guts takes the fortune teller story with more than just a grain of salt, but decides to keep his queries to himself when, as he was staring at the behelet, it decided to stare back. Griffith laughed it off as a freak occurrence and then immediately pivoted to his favorite topic of discussion, achieving his dreams. He tells Guts that everything they'd done up until this point was just a stepping stone towards his real objectives, and that they were just getting started. He told Guts he was going to have his own kingdom, and at that time he shines so bright you'd buy into his crap too if you were one of his falcons. But of course, we know what a literal red flag all of this is because we'd already seen a behel at work earlier in the series, and we'd seen Griffith as well, just not how he appeared during the Golden Age. In the Black Swordsman arc, when Guts goes after the Slug Count, he discovers that the Count's old physician, Vargas, had stolen his behelet, and gives us a breakdown about just what it is exactly. He calls it a key to summon the five members of the God Hand, and indeed, it works like a key of sorts when the Slug Count uses it during his fatal encounter with Guts. When the Count's blood, containing his intent despair at dying, and his intense desire to keep living, seeped into his behelet, it rearranged its features to resemble a tortured face that leaked tears of blood. It then let out a low-pitched scream which opened a dimensional tear, and summoned the God Hand. This is where we technically first meet Griffith, because he's already a part of the God Hand under the name Femto, so deducing that the Crimson Behelet 
had something to do with whatever went down between him and Guts wasn't a difficult leap. What was hard for us to digest was the scope and the scale of the sacrifices that it demanded in exchange for power. Give up those who tether you to your humanity, and you shall receive the ultimate power and an endless existence, the Crimson Behelet's sole purpose. Our first hint that something was going to go terribly wrong for the entire Band of the Falcon came during the very first encounter between Guts and Nosferatu Zod. The Apostle and the Swordsman were evenly matched in terms of their sword skills, but Zod possessed the raw, evil power of an Apostle, which gave him a natural advantage over Guts. He hurled the burly Swordsman through their fighting chamber like a sack of turnips and would have finished him off had Griffith and the Band of the Falcon not intervened at the last moment. Griffith ordered his men to pepper Zod with arrows while he went to get Guts himself. The pair managed to execute a pincer move on Zod and take off one of his arms, but the Apostle wasn't reputed to be the immortal god of the battlefield for no reason. Zod effortlessly swiped both Guts and Griffith aside and lamented the fact that he was about to lose the best fight of his life just as soon as he'd found it. He decided to finish off his opponents, starting with Griffith, but he stopped dead in his tracks once he saw the White Falcon's lucky talisman. The lion-faced apostle who had been chewing them out for being weaklings that couldn't satisfy his bloodlust for too long was now pissing himself bloody because of the Crimson Behelet. Curiously enough, Zod calls it the Egg of the King and then freaks out over the idea that a cub like Griffith could possess something as important as the Crimson Behelet. He looks up and mutters, God Hand, as some kind of realization hits him. Zod says to himself that it must be that kind of ploy and calls off the fight, choosing to depart the scene by giving Guts a prophecy instead. If he were a true friend of Griffith, then an inescapable death would pay him a visit soon. This same topic comes up even after Guts leaves the Band of the Falcon, when he encounters the Skull Knight for the first time. But the pieces were always there for us to put them together. During the customary autumn hunt that is hosted annually by the King of Midland, Griffith was supposed to die at the hands of an assassin carrying a crossbow bolt coated in a lethal poison. He does get hit with the bolt, but it miraculously lands in the mouth of his behelet instead of piercing through his flesh, which allows him to retaliate against the man who had ordered his death, Count Julius. It also allows him to sniff out any other suspicious players that wanted him out of the picture, and gives him the advantage over them as Griffith is able to turn his own would-be assassination into the deaths of all those who opposed him in Midland's royal court. At the time, Griffith thinks to himself that the Behelet truly must be a lucky charm for it to have saved him like this. But Guts has the right idea when he calls it the Devil's Luck. That's because it technically does come from the demon realm. The next time the story focuses on the Crimson Behelet is after Griffith gets captured and thrown in the Tower of Rebirth for committing the treasonous act of seducing Princess Charlotte. The King of Midland orders a year-long torture of the White Falcon, and his torturer takes disgustingly perverse pleasure in indulging his majesty, but his initial days do find him slipping up a bit, as the torturer was expressing his gratitude for the king's gracious present, i.e. Griffith as his captive, he notices the crimson behelet and decides to take it as a keepsake. Well, we say keepsake, but the torturer immediately fumbles the bag and drops the behelet in a drain, which then carries it away presumably to wherever it dumps out everyone else's crap as well. After this point, whatever semblance of pride Griffith had been clinging to as a means of staying sane, was knocked out of him. When he was first taken by the King of Midland, Griffith spat defiance in his captor's face and went so far as to reveal the King's hidden lust for his own daughter. As a result, he received a dozen lashings from the King himself and was thrown into a cell to await future torture, where Griffith would muse that everything he was going through at that moment was worthless. But at least he was still talking. When the Behelet swam away, he fell completely silent. Of course, it could also be that his tongue was removed by the torturer at that point, but we like to interpret it as Griffith thinking that he'd lost his luck as well now. From this point forward, everything that happens to him, he takes in a negative light. Guts comes to rescue him. Griffith tries to kill him immediately. Wilde exposes the reality of his condition to the Band of the Falcon, so he tries to force himself on Casca to regain his sense of control over them. No matter what he does, he seems to have no luck in it, except for when he escapes and realizes what he had truly always needed the most. When Wilde took Griffith captive, he was going to kill the man because he did not possess 
possess the Crimson Behelet. Behelets are like keys to the other side, as we've already explained in this video, and no doubt the dying apostle was looking to summon the God Hand to save him from his misery. But then, Zod arrives out of nowhere and impales Wilde to death on one of his horns. Wilde screams at Zod that he's making a mistake because apparently Griffith wasn't the one because he didn't have the Behelet. But Zod, who'd seen his Crimson Behelet personally, knew that Wilde was wrong. And either way, if Wilde wanted to kill Griffith because the creed given to him by the God Hand was to do as he pleased, then killing him was Zod's will, not the command of another. Before departing the scene, he tells Griffith that it will return to him when he needs it the most, because that's how these things are, and both Griffith and the reader can immediately guess what the Immortal One is talking about. Sure enough, when Griffith's dominance re-establishment plan fails, he goes unhinged insane and takes over a horse wagon in an attempt to chase the metaphorical castle from his dreams, going after a hallucination of his own younger self. His wagon hits a bump in the road and Griffith goes flying into a lake where he breaks his arm. He lets out a crazy laugh that's almost a howl and then tries to take his own life, but fails at doing even that. He then starts sobbing like a newborn baby, but suddenly, bafflingly, he sees his crimson behelet reappear. It rises from the bottom of the lake Griffith crashed in like it had always been one of the many pebbles that lie within it, but to Griffith, it was a sign. He recalled Zod's words to him when Wilde was dying in front of him, and though he didn't know the conditions for activating a behelet, he most certainly knew what he needed. Griffith, a man who had dared to dream the brightest dream, was burned by his own ambition and hubris, and reduced to a mere husk of a man. He was broken, he was bloody, and he could do nothing with his own two hands anymore. In one word, he was powerless. What he needed most at that moment was not the despair he was feeling as a consequence of his year-long torture, or his death wish which had brought him to this moment in the first place. He needed the absolute power to bring his dreams to reality once and for all, and acknowledging that, combined with the factors mentioned above, is what activates his behelet. Once the interstice is summoned, the God Hand arrives, and Void, their leader, rejoices at this sacred occasion. He goes on to address the apostles who had gathered in the interstice for this nocturnal feast, calling upon them to feast to their heart's content. He then addresses Griffith directly, claiming that he had been consecrated by the laws of causality, and that his desire had summoned them here, to give him what he had always wanted. Griffith looks apprehensive of all of this, but then Void calls him the blessed king of longing, and that one fever dream he had in his cell comes back to him, thus verifying in his mind that these were the people who would help him achieve his kingdom. After a few back and forth exchanges with Guts, the God Hand manages to convince Griffith that sacrificing his friends was the only way to achieve his lifelong dream, and to everyone's horror, he actually does it. After witnessing a manipulated montage of his life's journey up until the eclipse rolled around, Griffith affirms to himself that he was a stone-cold killer who only cared about his own dream and nothing else. Everyone and everything that distracted him from it was an abomination to him, and he willingly foregoes his own humanity in order to transcend and become a demonic being. A regular Behelet only has the power to reincarnate a human being as an apostle. Apostles, while extremely powerful, are basically human astral hybrids where their bodies belong to the physical world, but their souls belong to the abyss. When they die, their souls are dragged back into the abyss by its many tortured citizens. But the Crimson Behelet doesn't work that way. Its sole purpose for existing is to find a human candidate fit to transcend their humanity altogether, and when it's activated, it turns them into the ultimate demonic entity, a god hand. The most dangerous egg in the world. How the Crimson Behelet works, who made it, and why. It was clear from the very first time that it appeared on the pages of Berserk that the Crimson Behelet was in a league of its own as a magical artifact. It's not just the fact that it's the only Behelet whose coloring is specified in the entire series, it's also the fact that we first see Guts fight Griffith in his demonic form, and then meet Griffith before he became a demon, back when he still didn't know what the Behelet was actually for. As Void, Ubik, Slan, and Conrad work their manipulations on him, however, we start seeing the clear differences between a normal Behelet and the Crimson Behelet, and how the latter is far superior to its regular counterparts. A regular Behelet is sent out to any human being who possesses the necessary character traits for apostlehood. It finds its way to them and reappears to them when their suffering is at its worst, to grant them power as a reincarnated demon. But a regular Behelet does not simply vanish after it has been activated. Instead, it just reverts to its inert form, waiting for the next moment that its master calls upon it for its services. We see this during Guts's fight with the Slug Count, where 
where, despite being an apostle, the Count was able to activate the Behalit his physician had stolen from him years ago, and summon the God Hand for a second chance at life. Similarly, after Guts's destructive battle with Rosine, the Skull Knight can be seen plucking a Behalit out of a tree stump and ingesting it. This Behalit presumably belonged to Rosine herself, indicating that she might have become a twice reborn figure had she not redeemed herself towards the end of her existence. This simply cannot be the case for any possessor of the Crimson Behalit, simply because the event that it triggers is said to take place every 216 years. The Eclipse, which is the event that defines all of Berserk, is a nocturnal sacrificial ceremony that only occurs once in 216 years, which means that it goes dormant for the better part of a century after its activation before it can be reused. We say reused because we don't think there are five Crimson Behalits for five different God Hand members, we believe there's only one Crimson Behalit, and it's been used five times, with Griffith being the latest. This is based on a couple of factors, the first being that when Zod saw it dangling from Griffith's neck, he clearly called it THE Crimson Behalit, implying it was the only one of its kind. The second is that if a Behalit doesn't disappear after being used once, then lying dormant after being used to trigger an eclipse for a few decades before finding a new user makes sense as an operational model for the Crimson Behalit. This means that every God Hand member, Void, Slan, Ubik, Conrad, and Femto, used the same Crimson Behalit to obtain their otherworldly powers. And speaking of operations, that is perhaps the biggest difference between it and a regular Behalit, where a regular Behalit simply opens a fissure in a human being's soul that allows the Abyss's evil energy to flow into it, the Crimson Behalit takes everything that makes them a human in order to give them an existence that transcends all understanding. In Chapter 142, the Skull Knight explains that as a massive body of thought that makes itself known wherever a congregation of negative emotions gathers, the God Hand can be said to exist everywhere. But the operative word in that sentence is thought. The God Hand do not exist as physical beings. They are ethereal and tied to the deepest recesses of the astral world due to their inherent nature. This is what that fortune teller meant when she told Griffith that he would get the world in exchange for his flesh and blood. By using the Crimson Behalit, he gave up his human body and plunged his soul into the abyss to emerge with wings dark as a raven as the fifth God Hand member, Femto. As Femto, Griffith now only exists in the astral world. Though he has immense power and influence, he can only exert it covertly or whenever an interstice is opened using a Behalit. This is perhaps the greatest restriction of using a Crimson Behalit, because what good are superpowers when you can't use them all the time? This restriction can be bypassed by conducting an incarnation ceremony, whereby a God Hand member receives a body of flesh and their powers can finally affect the physical world itself. But because that happens only once in a thousand years, Griffith has apparently lucked out with his incarnation. Curiously enough, the only other member of the God Hand who should have been incarnated into the physical world is Void, who is clearly the first member of the God Hand, as evidenced in Chapter 362. Yet, for some reason, he remains restricted to the astral world, and is consistently the least involved God Hand member plot-wise, except for when he has to preside over important ceremonies like the Eclipse or the Invocation of Doom, which only he seems to be capable of performing. And now that we've reached the issue of performance, let's address the biggest mystery regarding the artifacts existence, who made it, and why. Canonically speaking, it was a massive, eye-riddled heart that remains nameless to this day, but we all know by this point that it's really the idea of evil. The deleted chapter 83 gives us more context on the idea's plans for the world, and Griffith in particular, but chapter 82 still gives us just enough context to surmise the creation story of the Crimson Behalit. As Griffith's astral body descends deeper and deeper into the abyss, he feels his comrade's deaths, caused by his hand pierce through him, yet he feels nothing. Griffith is emotionless in the face of having sacrificed people he knew for years, perhaps longer than he himself had been alive for. But as he continues to sink, his human curiosity rears its head because Griffith sees a massive shining droplet heading towards a shimmering pool. He asks himself what that is, and the idea of evil responds that it is the crystallization of the last tear he will ever shed. We then see a bunch of such tears rain past Griffith as he realizes that these are all best 
satellites. Griffith is kind of shocked by this because as far as he knew, his was the only one in existence. So the idea explains that behelots are nothing more than splashes. They are spiritual droplets primed with the idea of evil's powers that have spilled over from the abyss into eternity. In chapter 202, Flora tells Guts that a behelot cannot simply be used as a key to summon the God Hand, despite that being its sole function. It can only be activated when certain conditions are met, chief of which is the owner's desire to claim their power at their lowest point in life. A behelot is a highly spiritual object which is intricately linked to a person's fate. Ordinarily, it would appear and function as nothing but a rock to someone who isn't destined to use it. But for the chosen one, it becomes a means to transcend their humanity, in some cases, all the way into becoming a god hand. Flora speculates that behelots do not show up at random, but are rather sent into the world by the express wish and desire of some supreme power dwelling deep within the astral world. And she's right, because chapter 83 confirms that supreme power to be the idea of evil. In its deleted conversation with Griffith, the idea explains that it came into existence because humans desired reasons to justify their suffering, and as the creation of that desire, the idea's job is to keep creating more reasons for suffering. The idea then goes into a monologue about how it manipulates manipulated events and bloodlines for hundreds of years to ensure Griffith's arrival at this juncture. But the last statement is enough to explain the reason for the existence of the Crimson Behelet. The God Hand is, on multiple occasions, referred to as the agents of the idea of evil. Though, not explicitly because, lest we forget, the idea itself is still not canon. The idea sends out regular Behelets into the world to turn humans into apostles and keep the cycle of suffering going. But in order to guide that chaos into some kind of critical mass event, it needs shepherds. That's where the Crimson Behelet and the God Hand come in. The idea must have created the Crimson Behelet as a higher form of transformation solely because it needed someone, or in this case, multiple someones, to control the chaos that would be born of its creations. Because of the God Hand's immense power, the Crimson Behelet can only be used once every 216 years, with its user typically being granted the Behelet a few years before the temporal junction point of the Eclipse. Once it's used, it goes into hibernation till the Not One arrives having created a demon king with each usage. This point is not touched on often, but the God Hand had more titles than their names. This is especially true in the case of Femto, who was called the Fifth Demon King, the King of Longing, and the Guardian Angel of Longing as well with regards to his position in the God Hand. Each member of this group seems to be associated with one intense human emotion that, more often than not, turns out to have negative consequences. And that's thanks to them using the Crimson Behelet for their ascension. And because the power provided by the Crimson Behelet is so immense, the sacrifice required for it is also equally immense. In Griffith's case, he had to sacrifice the entire original band of the Falcon in order to ascend. The number of people he sacrificed is disputed, but an estimate comes up to somewhere between 300 to 500 people. We learned in the lead up to the Battle of Doldry that the band had around 5,000 cavalrymen at best, and when Guts catches up with the band a year after they're declared fugitives, less than a fifth of that number remains with Casca in the lot. Before they set out to rescue Griffith, she divides her ranks into two groups, one of which is devoured by apostles on their way to the Eclipse, and the other is sacrificed at the Eclipse itself. That's an awfully high number for an Apostle Sacrifice, which requires at best three people, as was the case for Grunbeld. Most other Apostles only had to sacrifice those near and dear to them, and that was usually just a handful of people. Griffith had to sacrifice literally hundreds of people to become a God Hand but with Ascension also raises a question. Will we ever see the Crimson Behelid again? The God Hand is supposedly complete with Femto's addition to their ranks, as he occupies the only formerly empty spot on the Hand of God, the Index Finger. With him filling that spot, there is no one left to occupy the Hand, so it stands to reason that the Crimson Behelid is pretty much done with the story at this point. But there is a small possibility that it might resurface, because notice how everything we've just said has been in the singular, and any kind of God would have two hands not just one. The Hand of God symbol that the God Hand makes their iconic stands upon is an unfurled right hand facing upwards. We are yet to see the left hand of God, so to speak, and there is a hint that such a thing might have existed, or will come to exist. The idea of fate in Berserk is not cyclical, it's a spiral. Events that happen in the past can happen in the future as well, although the sequence and outcomes depend on the players who are living them out in that future. Chapter 362 hinted that a version of the God Hand might have existed before the one that we know 
of, so it isn't a stretch of the imagination to think that another god hand might pop up a few centuries after the current story is finished. We wouldn't put it past Studio Gaga and Kuji Mori to end Berserk with an epilogue that shows some poor kid picking up a crimson behlet two centuries after Guts and Griffith's story comes to an end. And that, dear strugglers, is the beauty of Berserk. Marvelous verdict! But as for this video, we're afraid that's gonna have to be it. At the beginning of this video, we said that the Crimson Behelet is one of the most fascinating and terrifying objects in all of anime and manga history, and we hope we've laid out a strong case for our belief by its end. But what we're more interested in knowing is what you guys thought about the Crimson Behelet. So let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep struggling, fellow strugglers. Thank you.